and welcome to the screencast about one of the simplest animals on planet Earth, the sponge. This video covers standards E3, E4, and E5. Please remember you can pause this video at any time to take notes. Okay, let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to a special friend that I want to include in the screencast today. SpongeBob SquarePants has decided to come by for a little visit. So let's begin with the unifying characteristics of sponges. To begin with, they are all multicellular, so they have many cells. They are heterotrophic, meaning that they require nutrition. They have no cell walls, and they also contain a few specialized cells. Now you can see up here in the corner of the screen, we've got the typical sponge that you would use for cleaning in your household chores. However, this sponge is made out of plastic. So peripheria means pore bearers in Latin, as sponges have tiny openings or pores all over your, their body. So you can see in this diagram here, all the tiny pores. There are 10,000 species of sponges and 150 of those species are freshwater. The rest of the 8,500 species live in salt water in marine environments. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the body plan of the sponge. So the body plan is a hollow cylinder and acts as a functioning water pump. Water is pumped into the interior of the sponge and leaves from the larger hole at the top called the osculum. There's the osculum there. So the water comes in through the in-current pore and is then pumped out through the top. There are no tissues and no organs in a sponge. As for symmetry, all sponges are asymmetrical, meaning there is no symmetry. Skeleton. The skeleton is very simple in the sponge and there are two types. The first type is for harder sponges and like the glass sponge, for example, they're made up of spiny spicules of calcium carbonate. So you can, here's a spicule located right in here, or silicon dioxide. Now, softer sponges, such as the type that you would use in the bathtub, are made of spongin, which is a network of flexible protein fibers. These sponges that are used as natural bath sponges. Now within the cell, there's also some specialized cells that have more than one name. So beginning with the collar cells that line the inside of the sponge, they can be called collar cell as well as keanocyte. So you need to be familiar with both those names. The amoebocyte is the wandering cell that means it can wander throughout the body wall of the entire sponge. So it again has two names, amoebocyte and archaeocyte. And again, you have to be familiar with both those names. And finally, the spicule. Just has one name and up above here is a photograph taken with a microscope of a whole bunch of spicules, but here's one here, just to give you an idea of what it actually looks like. So the spicule provides support for the skeleton of the sponge. Okay, let's move on to all the life functions of the sponge, and let's begin with feeding. So sponges are filter feeders. Sponges are filter feeders. As the flagellum, within the collar cells or the keanocytes pump water through the body of the sponge, the collar cells actually sift out all the different particles of food. The microscopic food particles then enter the collar cell and they begin to get digested. The digested nutrients then diffuse out 
side of the body wall because there's a very high concentration inside of the collar cell and there's a lower concentration outside here. Now next up is the amebocyte. The amebocyte comes up here and the nutrients diffuse into the amebocyte and then the amebocyte is going to carry those nutrients to all the other areas of the cell or sorry through the sponge through the body wall. So the amebocyte can wander all throughout the cell. So the water comes in through the incurrent cell and carries in all kinds of particles, which then get taken into the collar cells. The collar cells digest the nutrients and the nutrients then diffuse out to the amebocytes. And the amebocytes then carry the nutrients to other parts of the sponge. Here you can quickly see there's three layers. This is the ectoderm here. We've got the mesoglia, another layer here, and this is the endoderm, the collar cells. So let's move on to the next functions, respiration, internal transport, and excretion. All occur through diffusion. Now diffusion, is the movement of particles from a high concentration area to a low concentration area. So oxygen diffuses from outside the sponge. Now you have to imagine the sponge is shaped like this and this is the osculum at the top. So the oxygen diffuses into the sponge. The carbon dioxide and the ammonia diffuse out into the spongocele or the inner cavity of the sponge and then are excreted out through the osculum through the pumping of the water by the flagella. Okay, let's move on to reproduction. Sponges use asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction methods. Let's begin by discussing the asexual reproduction methods of the sponge that create an offspring that is genetically identical to the parent sponge. There are three methods. The first method is fragmentation. That refers to a, spon a sponge's amazing ability to regenerate, which means to regrow a missing part. A very small piece of the sponge can regenerate into a complete sponge. Ah, I'm missing my arm. The sponge regrows into a new SpongeBob SquarePants. Budding refers to um, a sponge growing a little tiny bud or sponge off the side of it and then that sponge falls down to the ocean floor and then begins to grow there. And finally the third form of asexual reproduction is producing gemmules. So what happens here is when there's difficult conditions present such as the sponge needs to survive droughts or free freezing temperatures, the sponge will produce gemmules. Help me, my house is shrinking. Gemmules are groups of archaeocytes surrounded by a tough outer coating of spicules to protect them. The gemmule will survive even if the adult sponge perishes or is killed off by harsh conditions. Once the favorable conditions return, such as a damper environment and warmer temperatures, then the gemmules will regrow into an adult sponge. Okay, now on to sexual reproduction. Sponges carry out internal reproduction and the larvae are motile. Most sponges create both sperm and eggs, so they are hermaphrodites. However, the sperm do fertilize the egg in another sponge, not the same egg within the same sponge. For example, we've got an adult male here, which releases the sperm through the osculum. The sperm then either enter in through the osculum or in through an incurrent pore and are taken into the collar cells. The collar cells engulf that sperm and then bring the sperm into the body wall of the sponge. 
the archaeocytes then carry the sperm to the egg, and the zygote then grows into a larvae. This larvae has tiny little flagella which allow it to move outside the body wall of the sponge, and then the larvae exits through the osculum and is carried by water currents to a new area on the sea floor. So the larvae is the motile form of the sponge. The larvae will eventually settle on the sea floor and grow into a young sponge. Now remember, this new sponge will not be genetically identical to the parents because it came from two different haploids. Let's move on to response or the nervous system. Now the sponge does not possess a nervous system that allows them to respond to changes in their environment. So how do they protect themselves from predators or animals that will eat them? Some sponges produce toxins that make them poisonous to predators. On to motility. Sponges are sessile as they spend their entire adult life in one location or spot. So how can a sponge be still classified as an animal? Because when sponges reproduce, they release a larvae that has all these little flagella on it that is free swimming and it can be carried by water currents and eventually settle on the sea floor. Cha-ching! That is why sponges can still be classified as animals, even though the adult life form is sessile or does not move. Let's move on to the ecological role of peripherians. Why do we have sponges in the marine and freshwater environments? How do they serve the other organisms that they live with? Well, number one, they provide shelter for other animals, such as shrimp, snails, sea stars. These animals can actually live right inside of the sponge. Sponges also provide a protected area for other plants. So some plants grow on the outside as well as the inside of the sponge. Now, these plants provide the sponge with oxygen and food and the sponge provides those plants with that protected area. And now you know all about the life of sponges or SpongeBob SquarePants. For further info, if you want to learn or discover more about some special sponges off the coast of BC, please Google Global News and BC Sponge. Or if you want to learn more about sponge reproduction and function, please Google sponge reproduction and function. Well, I hope that helped. Thanks for watching.